Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I have to warn you, I have a little bit of allergies here, so, you know, with this hot weather. My name's Eric Stover. I'm the co-faculty director of the Human Rights Center uh, with my colleague who will be out here shortly, Alexa Koenig, uh, who's also co-faculty director. We are pleased uh, that uh, we are uh, sponsoring this event with the Miller Institute and want to thank them for participating. So run of show, we will, I'm going to make a very brief introduction, a little bit background of the Human Rights Center's relationship with the International Criminal Court, and then I will introduce Judge Peter Hofmansky. So first of all, um, the Human Rights Center, we have worked on witness studies with various courts, and when the, with the International Criminal Court was being established, we worked with their witness uh, section to help them in, in finding ways to have secure ways of handling witnesses. Uh, later, we did a study of their victim participation program in three countries so we could feed back to them. And most recently, uh, well, I'd say the last 10, 12 years, we have worked in several workshops at the International Criminal Court with the Office of the Prosecutor looking at the use of uh, uh, open source investigations material. And, Alexa Koenig is co-director of the Technology Advisory Board with the International Criminal Court. So with that, just a very brief uh, introduction. Also, everyone, if you have a cell phone and it's not on silent mode, please do that. It's always my sin. Um, and um, so Judge uh, Hofmansky is, first of all, in 1981, he's a Polish judge. In 1981, he's got his doctorate degree in, in law, and he's gone on to publish a number of papers, some 300 papers, academic journals and books, and uh, he went in 2015 to uh, serve at uh, the ICC, and in 2021 he was named the president, and he is also uh, in the appellate chambers of the court. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to have him come out and uh, tell you a little bit about his background and the issues that we'll be covering here, and then we'll turn to the conversation and have a Q&A. So with that, he would welcome the judge. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Great to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation to Berkeley University. I've been invited to the Fleet Week in San Francisco here and just as used the opportunity and accepted the invitation for the university to meet colleagues from academia, students. It's my award because I'm not only judge, I have the academic background. I love to meet students, colleagues, and to have the open and frank discussion, which I understand is possible today. So, I'm allowed just to, to, to speak for five, seven minutes, just to give short introduction, the opening statements, and there we'll have discussion. Uh, they understand that we will be the substantive part of this meeting. So uh, uh, let me just um, uh, say that, that I'm really, really delighted to be here. Um, two words about me. I have been a judge uh, as well, the professor of international criminal law, uh, basically for over than 40 years. And I have two parts of the career out simultaneously in my country, because in my country, which is Poland, uh, it was possible to, to be a judge and a professor at the university at the same time. So I used the opportunity to, to, uh, to, to practice and to make research and to use my experiences in both fields, which is a good thing, I think. Uh, but then I have been elected uh, judge of International Criminal Court 2015, uh, and I'm just, just about to finish my term in next uh, year, and for the remaining three years of my mandate, my colleagues, judges, elected me as president uh, of the court, which I'm very proud of. So, uh, three short points. First, uh, International Criminal Court is, as you know, the first permanent 
international tribunal, uh, and it is indeed the huge achievement of international law, a huge achievement of international community that it was possible to create it. Um, towards uh, about the history, you know, uh, the history of the international criminal law is not too long. There were first attempts to create such a tribunal uh, after World War One, but it was there was it was no success. But after World War II, the two tribunals were created in Nuremberg and Tokyo. And then after a while, in the 70s, it was again uh, the necessity to create the new tribunals, what the UN with the resolution did. They created the ICTY, the former Yugoslavia tribunal, the Rwanda tribunal. So, and there also was many other tribunals um, raising, dealing with the, with the cases in, uh, all around the world. And then the international community realized that it is the time to think about the uh, permanent institution, that it is not the, the solution just to create the new tribunals uh, always the, where we have the conflict somewhere. So they create the, the, the tri tribunal for the future. And this is really very important. For the future means it was a tribunal created not to deal with the past. It was not a tribunal created by the winners against losers. It was a tribunal created for something which will happen after its creation, which is, of course, from the general principles of criminal law, non-retroactivity, crucial. And that is the huge advantage of, of, of this court. What is the role of the criminal court, uh, international criminal court? Uh, as the, the preamble to the Rome Statute, which is the founding treaty of, uh, of the court, uh, says it is to fight um, uh, impunity in respect to uh, crimes under the jurisdiction of the court, which is the genocide, the crime against humanity, war crimes, and added a few la uh, years later aggression. Uh, so, the statute says, I quote, we have to close the gap of impunity. To close the gap means that it's not our task to deal with all the cases all around the world. We are working on the basis of the principle of complementarity, which means that the primacy is always on the national jurisdiction. If something happened here and there, the national courts are obliged to proceed and prosecute and investigate and prosecute cases. And we, international criminal courts, step in only if it's not possible for various reasons, for legal, practical. Uh, so sometimes uh, just the, 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 the local authorities don't want to prosecute persons because of their position in the state structure. That could be different reasons. But we are only the court of the last resort. And it is quite important to understand how we work, because it's, it wouldn't be realistic to expect that 18 judges uh, elected to criminal, uh, International Criminal Court are able to deal with all the uh, atrocities all around the world. So we really uh, do, I would say, selective justice, only when victims cannot uh, expect or not receive justice from national jurisdictions. So this is the, the, the one point I wanted to to raise in the beginning. As a, the, the, <clears throat> the other point, which is also, I think, significant, and I just would like to raise it now, it is something which is new in the, in the international criminal law and international criminal justice. So we are the court which is victim-centered. So victims are the center of the system. And it is new because in Nuremberg, Tokyo, in ICTY, ICTR, victims were used as witnesses only. They are present in the courtroom, but they didn't enjoy the rights. They didn't participate in the proceedings. And this has changed dramatically after the creation of the International Criminal Court. Because victims have firstly the right to participate in the proceedings on all the stages. And secondly, they have the right to reparations. So it is, could be strange from the American point of view that, you know, that it is criminal court, but we do something which is more uh, like civil claim. Huh? But indeed, 
And then we combine these two functions. And so we bring justice to victims, not only so-called retributive justice, to give them satisfaction that the perpetrator is convicted, but we also bring the reparative justice. So we have the, reparative, uh, the, the, the reparation programs developed. We have the trust fund for victims who collect the money, resources for it. And we have, we, today after 20 years, I would say we have more than, than 100,000 victims who are covered by uh, reparation programs uh, organized and implemented by, uh, by the court, which is, I think, a remarkable number. It is something, it's quite something already. So, as I said, 20 years of activity, we have uh, already some achievements, but there's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. Do I have still two minutes? Yeah. Two minutes, okay, fine. 123 states joined the Rome Statute. This is two thirds of the states of the world. Great, but it is still not enough. And we try to attract other states to join. And I think this is the step where every democratic country which values such a values as rule of law, democracy, peace, security should undertake. Uh, as you know, US is not a state party to the wrong statute, and we expect US to join. I make a call yesterday, talking with the military and the decision makers about this issue. We really hope that it's time to do so. It is the momentum we have to use. Of course, we had the bad times with the uh, US during the Trump administration. We have a honeymoon now, and we expect that it will continue. And finally, the US take this mile step and ratify the statute. It's really better to be in than to be out. Because then you have the influence and the development of the international criminal law. You uh, participate in the, in, the, in the debates of the assembly of state parties to the statute. You uh, can put the candidates for the judicial election and so on and so forth. It's really, really important. And last but not least, the state joining the statute shows a commitment to these values I was talking about. It's really important to be with us. It's not very funny to hear that from the NATO countries only uh, Turkey and US are not member states to the statute. It's not funny to hear that from the Americas, the only US, Bahamas, uh, Cuba and Nicaragua are not the state parties. So we hope US to join. We hope you ask to join, and we hope to work together to, to make this world better. I think it's something quite important what we do. So I will stop because I will exceed probably already. <laughs> no, that's Let's... quite all right. Thank you. So thank you for those opening remarks and thank you for all of you uh, for being here with us this evening so that we have this incredibly rare opportunity to ask questions to the president. Um, first I want to congratulate you. There's been a lot happening in the past couple of weeks with the International Criminal Court. Um, perhaps most notoriously, of course, Russia has just added you to the wanted list um, for the country, which I think does warrant to some extent a congratulations, because I think it says that at least the International Criminal Court is not being ignored and cannot be ignored given the impact that it's having in the world. But perhaps more positively, congratulations on the steps that Armenia has taken over the last 10 days to uh, just take steps towards ratifying and becoming the 124th state. Um, a couple of questions. First, how does one become the president of the ICC, and what does a day in the president look like? Yeah, so <laughs> the, the first question is, is, is simple. It's, it's the decision of judges. Though, although judges are elected by states, but then after they, the bench of the judges is established, then judges decide who will preside over the court. So it's a decision of judges, and I personally value this decision much more than my colleagues 
uh, believe in me and that you are the person who to lead this institution? This is the first question. Okay. Uh, and the second was? The second was, what is a day in the life of the president Oh, look difficult, like? my dear. It's very <laughs> difficult. Now, it is difficult because I am wearing two hats. I am the president of the court, but at the same time, I am, according to the statute also, the judge of the appeals chamber to the court. So I have to, just to share my, my time between the judicial work, mm -hmm. the appeals chamber, and the administration and management uh, uh, in the presidency, uh, and I would say, if you are uh, uh, asking for, for the normal day, I would say 90% of my time is the administration. I have not enough time for my judicial mm -hmm. work, what I'm very worried about, because to tell you true, I am not always good prepared for the deliberations of my colleagues, because I have simply no time I have to, 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 to deal with, with many, many issues mm -hmm. related to the cooperation with states, with the, the, to, to the uh, enforcement of, of, of the court's decisions, with of course many external relations. I, you know, I'm a judge, I'm not a politician, but I, I think I've become a little bit a politician after a few years because I have a lot of interactions with the state actors, talking, to, for example, with Armenia about ratification of other states, but also visiting uh, the United States, which is of course the great present for me and I'm very happy uh, with it. So, a uh, lot of travels, a mm -hmm. lot of travels, a lot of administration, uh, and of course, judicial work uh, as the small edition. Thank you. So you mentioned the role, the central role that victims play in the International Criminal Court and the, the court really being shaped around their needs <coughs> and interests, and you brought up reparations. How is that going? What are you seeing in terms of the advancement of reparations for victims of mass atrocity? <coughs> Sorry, yeah, no, it's a long process. This is a long process. And firstly, we have the reparations ordered by the courts. Mm -hmm. So, if the person, accused person, is convicted, then we start the next stage of the proceeding, which is the reparation stage, and the judges issue the reparation order, and then this order is implemented on ground. Uh, it's costly, very costly, and you know. As a matter of principle, the convicted person should pay for the reparation. But it's, you know, we are we are talking about the mass crimes, where we have hundreds of thousands of victims. So the reparation is many, many millions U.S. dollars, uh, or even euro. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, it's it's we have never the, the, the perpetrator who have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So therefore we created the special trust fund for victims, which is the institution that collects money from the uh, state donors, private donors, for many, many resources, and they, on that basis, prepare the reparations program, which is confirmed at, um, by judges and implemented under the judicial supervision. Yeah. But one thing I would add, Mm, that the trust for, for victims had also additional mandate, which is, we called it assistant ma mandate, which means that they could provide the reparation for the victims of atrocities, regardless of the judgment of the court. Mm. So if we have the situation country, if we, had <coughs> if we have <coughs> uh, victims of uh, international crimes that are not covered, I would say covered, by, by the judgments of, of uh, conviction, mm -hmm. uh, it, then it's still a possibility that the victims will be, uh, will be um, involved in the reparation programs uh, of the trust fund for the victims. And it's really fantastic things. I, 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 I really enjoy to see uh, these brave people visiting, for example, in Central Africa mm -hmm. last year to see these this, uh, women raped many times during the conflict. Uh, the, the, the women, they lost the ch children, the, the men, uh, they, they, are, they are very much involved in, in this program and enjoy really very much um, the help of the Trust Fund for Victims. Mm -hmm. It's a great thing what, what, what the Trust Fund for Victims does. What are some of the reparations that they've managed to make possible? Are they mostly collective? Are there individual reparations or what are you seeing? It could be different. Mm -hmm. the, of course, the individual are probably most expensive. Mm -hmm. But we had the cases that, that uh, victims received the individual reparation. It depends on the, 
availability of resources, uh, depends on the number of victims uh, related to the case. But uh, normally we have the collective preparation. It could be very different things. It could be the uh, broad programs for the community. We sometimes uh, build the school that was destroyed during mm -hmm. the conflict. We can build the hospital. But even could be symbolic. We just found the monument, uh, all these things. And it really could be different. The, the ideas could be, could be really uh, unlimited. There's a quote that's always stuck with me where someone said in the aftermath of a mass atrocity, if someone ever says a response is just symbolic, they really don't understand what a symbol is because of the weight that it can carry in terms of the history that it brings with it, et cetera. Um, money, I'm sure, is always a challenge for the court. What other challenges are you seeing for the ICC now, and what do you anticipate in the future? <sighs> the huge challenges to survive mm -hmm. in difficult times. You know, we have difficult time. Mm -hmm. We had also difficult time with the U.S. Uh, it survived, but we have now also difficult time because, as you said, one of one third of the judges is under arrest warrants now. Uh, we have also very serious cyber attacks against our system, mm -hmm. which, mm, well, it's uh, not uh, very easy to manage. It's also very costly to protect. Uh, I've the heard system. some of the investigators have had to go mm -hmm. offline and ah, do some yeah, of their work. Yeah, this is very, very difficult, and we, we we see that there's many attempts to paralyze our work. There's a lot of political pressure on the court, but you know, judges are brave people. We are resistant. We, we do our job. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it will not influence, uh, influence uh, uh, the real um, work of the judges. What are you most excited about in terms of what you're seeing in the evolution? I know you just celebrated your 20th anniversary at the ICC. What are you excited about for the future or the changes that you know are coming? You know, I am optimist. I, in, in, many, in all the areas of, the, of life, and also in respect to, 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 to the International Criminal Court and the future of international criminal justice, I think that was really important and, and good decision of states to create the ICC. And it's, I think this is really uh, important that after 21 years of existence, we still exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's quite remarkable achievements. You know, sometimes we are criticized because we said, well, there's a few cases only before the International Criminal Court. But look, it's not few cases. If you have the case where you have 300,000 uh, 300, of victims, it's like 300,000 cases before the National Court sometimes. You know, we have hundreds of, of, of witnesses to be, to be heard. We have, well, the evidence would be carried out in the courtroom for three years. So there are the really huge cases. Mm -hmm. So 53 persons were accused before the court so far. It's quite a lot after mm -hmm. 20 years, I think. So it is an achievement. But, you know, there are all challenges. There are challenges. I think that the, the most important challenge is just to to ensure that the court is able to continue independently. Because, you know, the, the old attempts to, um, to, to, to disturb uh, are undertaken with the mind that just to undermine our independence. But we are, as I said, resistant. And we, we, will, we will do our job. Mm -hmm as expected by the international community. What would you like to see for the court next? Are there milestones you'd like to see it reach or new avenues of practice? I'd be happy to see states ready to provide more resources for the court. Uh, because, you know, resources are crucial from the point of view of the scope of our operations. It would be horrible for all of us if, because of the lack of resources, you would be forced to limit the scope of our operations. Yeah. But this is, of course, a problem because 
because you know the world is in, the, in the crisis. Nobody would like to increase the budget, but if you would like to keep our operation at the same level, then we have at least cover the the in, in, uh, inflation at least. But we would like to extend also the scope of our operation, and I think it will be necessary in the next uh, year. Which is not a very good news, because we would be happy just not to see conflicts, not to see atrocities. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, our goal is just to close the gap of impunity and to finish uh, impunity. And to give um, anyone who's not aware of the statistic already some perspective on the size of the budget for the Office of the Prosecutor, at least at the <coughs> International Criminal Court, when we last checked several years ago, the budget was equivalent for the entire Office of the Prosecutor to the police in, here in Berkeley, California. Uh -huh. And their mandate's the entire world. So what they were trying to do in terms of bringing so many people to justice um, ultimately was a very uphill battle without the resources to put behind it. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you see as the next steps for the United States? You brought up the fact that the United States is not a party to the Rome Statute. The background is that we did sign the Rome Statute back um, in very early days before 9-11, and then 9-11 came. I think there was a shift in policy and also a shift in the presidency here in the United States. Uh, we were supposed to ratify the Rome Statute and unfortunately withdrew our signature. And our stance actually turned quite hostile. In the aftermath of 9-11, we passed the American Service Members Protection Act, a portion of which has been um, called the Invade the Hague Act, in part because the United States reserved the right that if any American was ever taken to the Hague for prosecution, that we would invade the Hague militarily and extract that American by force. Um, since then, I think the United States has recognized that there are true benefits to cooperation. For example, um, when political, its political interests align with those of the court, most notably, one example would be Libya, etc. We saw the Dodd Amendment, which then softened our stance and allowed for cooperation in very specific situations where the president authorizes that. I know in the context of Ukraine, we've seen a real softening towards the court. Are you able to talk a little bit about how that relationship is changing? There were many ways, you know, <laughs> at the beginning, of course, the United States was very active in the process of creation of the ACC. As you said, it was the, in Rome and uh, then the, the, the conference was, was, was finished in uh, 1998. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the United States were really very active uh, participant of the conference. They signed the statute and then would draw the, 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 the signature, which has no legal consequences, mm -hmm. it's a purely symbolic act. There was nothing like that in the international law would draw the signature. The fact is that they didn't ratify the statute. Mm -hmm. It did the, 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 the step. It, it, it was not, not uh, done. Uh, you explained the reasons for, for, for that. I uh, think that the, the proper answer is the complementarity. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something what we discussed yesterday in the Fleet Week. Well, if the reliable member of our family, which values rule of law, values peace, security, human rights, will be in the situation where the action will be necessary, will be needed, they will undertake this action. We basically intervene only in the situation that's completely not possible. Well, for example, the judiciary system is destroyed. There's no courts, mm -hmm. for example. Or there's the, uh, the, 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 the fact, uh, factual obstacles just to, to, to proceed to investigate. Then we can help. But our role is just encourage states to do it in their own. Mm -hmm. So Therefore, it's crucially important that the state implement the law of the Rome Statutes, to implement to the national legal orders, just to have the legal basis for these mm. investigations, prosecutors. And to be concrete, if something happened, if the US or US personnel will commit crime somewhere in the territory of the state party, or even not state party, because we have also jurisdiction in respect to the citizenship of the state party. 
then simply we have to believe that the judicial system of this country is strong enough mm -hmm. and re reliable that the intervention of the ICC will be not necessary. And this is how it works. And it is, it is why the drafter of the statute say the role of the court, the mandate, is to close the gap of impunity. Close the gap. That's remarkable. But it is not necessary the case that the gap will be there. And of course, the gap needs to be closed by the state. And this is what we expect. I think that uh, we raise such an important point. Um, I oftentimes the the court is really judged based on the number of people that have been convicted, as opposed to the full spectrum of impact that it's having. One thing we have definitely observed is sort of the leadership role that the court is playing for other countries. For example, with the Berkeley Protocol on digital open source investigations. Uh, your court was one of the first to work with us to actually figure out how can digital technologies come in to strengthen the evidentiary foundations of cases. And then that becomes a model for other countries through the complementarity process. Um, certainly the Rome Statute and the provisions of the Rome Statute being adopted at the national level and folded into national level ways of thinking and operating that are quite important. Um, so I do think we need to always take that broader look at where the positive impact as well as some of the challenges. I was asked by a colleague who couldn't be here today, um, she wanted me to convey to you, are there any opportunities for students, for others from outside the court, since we are not a party to the court, to get involved? And if so, what those might be? So if, if it comes to the um, uh, recruitment process, uh, do we don't close the door for the non-state parties people. But if we have the candidates from state party and non-state party, and this is the same level of qualification, mm -hmm. then you will lose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I've seen a few Americans who tried to get into the court for whom that was but the case. But we have Americans in the court. Mm -hmm. We have Americans. You definitely do. Quite a few. Yeah, obviously. But U.S. being out is not able to put the candidature for the judge. Mm -hmm. Uh, we will never have the, the, the president of the court the because you have to be a judge before. You cannot be a prosecutor of the court. Mm. You know, you cannot be registered. A registrar theoretically could be, yeah? But it never happened. Okay. So in practical terms, you have to be in, not out. Mm. Got it. Um, before we open it up to Q&A for everyone who's here, any final comments or thoughts that you'd like to share on the future of the court, its challenges or opportunities? So I, I also ta talking about the challenges, mm -hmm. I think. This is to keep independence and to, to uh, ensure that we are safe. Uh, final comments, happy to be here. And I'm really <laughs> happy to, 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 to talk to, to students have the opportunity to see you all and if possible also answer your questions. Wonderful. We have two runners, um, two individuals who have mics, and I see one hand back here we can start with in the middle. Hello. Uh, thank you, President, for the uh, wonderful discussion we just witnessed. Uh, my name is Chuki. I just wanted to ask you um, why do you think the International Criminal Court has not been able to find China uh, accountable uh, for the continuing human rights violations uh, in uh, East Turkestan uh, and, uh, and, for, and with Tibetans who have been uh, on occupied land for so long? Uh, is it because uh, China has not signed the Rome Statute? But uh, I wanted to know your thoughts on whether this is reason enough to uh, not investigate into the human rights violations uh, that the state is, uh, how the state is treating its minorities. Hey, answer now. Yes, please. So China is, of course, another question and a problem. China is not a state party to the Rome Statute, as you know. So we are limited as far as jurisdiction is concerned because um, 
we could have jurisdiction over the action undertaken in China abroad on the territory of the state party. If you are talking about the human rights violation internally, the door for the ICC is closed. It is the, the, the same basically reason that we cannot investigate the, the atrocities in Syria or in North Korea. Now we know that this allegedly there are crimes under the rules that is committed, but we have no chance to go in to step in. The only way, theoretically, would be the resolution of the Security Council of the United Nations. They have just referred the case to the ICC regardless of the territory where the crime were committed mm -hmm. and regardless of the citizenship of the alleged perpetrators. But here we are, with, we have another problem. We have the problem that some countries are the permanent members of the Security Council and never allowed just uh, to, uh, to, act, uh, to, 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 to make such a re uh, uh, resolution. So, and of course, China is one of, of these uh, countries and for the same reasons uh, why we cannot investigate the crimes allegedly committed in North Korea. Well, the same with China. So I think that China is, is, is far away from the ratification, but of course, the door is open mm -hmm. for everybody, for everybody. We don't expect Russia, for example, to ratify the, the, the status this week. <laughs> uh, and uh, with some countries, there are more difficult relationship. Great, thank you. We have one up here. Hello. Hello. Is it one? Oh. Thank you so much for being here. Um, being part of the Human Rights Center, um, we work a lot with open source investigations and kind of um, getting digital evidence of human rights violations around the world. And I know back in 2017, the ICC actually approved the first um, social media evidence, if I'm not wrong. They issued the warrant of arrest for Al Wolf Frawley yes. based on social media evidence. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, what do you think um, the role of social media evidence and open source investigations will be like in the future in the ICC? Well, everything depends on the liability of these evidence. It is always the individual decision of the prosecutor whether he would present the evidence. And of course, at the end of the day, it's the decision of the, of the of judges when they will assess this, uh, this uh, um, pieces of evidence as valuable or not. So in any case, the Rome Statute does not close the catalog of the ev admissible evidence. Everything could be used, everything. There's no limitation. Therefore, of course, the social me media uh, uh, sources uh, could be also be considered. But I, I, it's difficult to answer the question, but it depends. It depends on the circumstances of the case. How is the relation of these specific piece of evidence to, to others? You know, in the, in, the, in, in the ICC, judges make the holistic assessment of all the evidence at the end of the trial uh, without considering to the, 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 the each uh, piece of evidence separately. So uh, if you have the broader pictures, you can try to answer the question, what would be the role of the social media, media evidence or other electronic evidence? Um, just to understand the situation, to to draw the, the, the picture of the case. Mm. Right, thank you. Mm. Any other questions? I see one back here. Um, hello, my name is Mark. Um, thank you for um, an awesome um, talk. I just had a question about um, Sudan specifically. Um, it is a non-state party, um, and the case of Darfur specifically has been going for um, a little while. Um, the problem with, in, in Sudan's case, uh, for example, the National Assembly has been dissolved for a few years now, so there is pretty much little to no way for them to ratify the statute. So um, how is this different, um, and, and how can the court act in, in a case like this where it is a non-state party, but at the same time, it is not a fully, um, a fully developed state where they can actually ratify and be able to bring in the people that have, been, um, that have warrants? 
the case, the situation of Sudan is the specific one, because indeed Sudan is not the state party. Sudanese authorities did notify the, 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 the statute. But we have the Security Council resolution. It opened the jurisdiction of the court over the situation in Darfur. So it is not a problem, uh, it's not a problem of jurisdiction. So the ratification of the statute will change nothing in respect to the scope of jurisdiction um, if it comes to the Darfur uh, situation, what happened there mm -hmm. in a the certain period of time, covered by the um, resolution of the Security Council. So uh, we have the situation. We had a lot of problems with this case. You know, it was the, the problem, um, which is, I, I think, the important step in the uh, and the development of the jurisprudence of the court in respect to the immunities of heads, the head of states, in respect to the arrest warrants with the former president of, the, of, of Sudan. Uh, it's interesting, but it's different than other countries, because even the issue of the immunity of heads of states looks differently if we have the UN referral. It could be a source of the obligation of the state to execute. Um, but also in respect to other issues, this is the specific situation. But, you know, it is difficult. The cooperation with the Sudanese authorities is complicated, but we still have a pending case before, before the judges now in the courtroom. Is the Abd al Rahman case, which is uh, accused for t t 31 uh, counts, quite a remarkable number. And uh, well, we still expect that, that after the situation in, in, in uh, uh, Sudan will improve uh, in terms of, well, democratization of the structures, mm -hmm. then uh, Mr. Al Bashir and other accused person will be surrendered to the court. Thank you. I see another one back in the back. Um, Sharon, if you don't mind passing it. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, so in 2016 and 2017, there was a wave of uh, African countries that called for withdrawal from the court uh, for allegations of selective justice. I think if I remember correctly, when Minister of the Gambe went so far as to say that the ICC actually stands for International Caucasian Court for the <laughs> prosecution of Africans. And some commentators said that there was some merit to the allegations of, you know, because states like the U.S. weren't party to them, that effectively you're investigating crimes in the African Union. Now, these, um, something like this has resurfaced recently with South Africa. Um, again, I think trying to leave the court. You know the facts better than I do. But what I wanted to ask was, do you think that um, there were also a lot of developments in the past six to seven years uh, with regard to selective justice and with regard specifically to African countries, to broadening the, the scope of investigations to other countries? So. Do you think that there's these um, questions, um, and particularly the threats of withdrawal by African countries and their concerns over selective justice, have those been alleviated or put to rest? Um, I hope the question is clear. Yeah, the colleague of the sound is not perfect. I, I, I hope that I understood the question. Uh, so uh, maybe two words about mm -hmm. the situation with African states. So as you know, at the beginning of the of the functioning of the of the court, we had uh, the, basically only the African uh, situations investigations, and we are accused by African states, but we are targeting the African leaders only. Uh, it was a lot of rumor. Was there also the wave of the uh, uh, attempts to withdraw from the state? There was a lot of discussion rumor about it. But uh, the fact is that we had the American case before the court simply because the American states referred the cases to the court. They asked the ICC to intervene. The exception was Sudan and Libya, but mm -hmm. all, all the situations in the court were just triggered by, by, uh, by the states, partly by the prosecutor, but basically the case. Uh, anyway, and it is not the case now, because uh, you, as you know, the, 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 the six newest investigations in other continents is Asia, is South America, is Europe, it's not in Africa, and now the situation is, I think, is a little bit better. It's not perfect. We are still involved, we have still reparation progress, we are still very active in the African continent. But I, I think it's not the answer to the question. We, we have some difficulties in cooperation with African states, but also with other states. It is, it is, of course, very important 
uh, element of the whole structure because we rely on the cooperation of states. We have not the enforcement mechanism in, in, the, in the court. We cannot just go to arrest someone, to capture someone. Even uh, as a president, I cannot capture someone on the street. We, we have no our, our own police or the forces, nothing. So we have to rely on states. And now, uh, of course, it it's, could be sometimes the case that the states are not really keen to cooperate. And this is sometimes with, the, with, with African states that are not always keen. Some of them cooperate fantastic. Some of them not. The example with the South Africa, the main, I, I think you're thinking about the Al-Bashir situation, yeah? When, when the, he was visiting the, 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 the South Africa mm -hmm. and he was under the arrest warrant, they didn't arrest um, the President Al-Bashir and there was the decision of the Supreme Court that they should do it and there was, of course, left the, left the country before they enforced the decision of the court. It was complicated, it was complicated. Now we had the similar discussion uh, after we heard that the BRICS uh, 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 summit is a uh, plan in, 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 in South Africa, and one of the persons under the arrest warrants planned mm. to attend. Uh, but, you know, of course, I, I would be happy that the, the, this, the, the, it would be different, that it would come and be captured, it would be better. But, uh, of course, the Africans decided that that is better not to invite the person and just to stop it because they have the uh, obligation, which is already a good sign. Which is already a good sign. We are a reliable member of the system. We have the legal obligation to cooperate fully. And, uh, well, we will. This is where we stand. I, I'm not sure what is answer the question. I think, you no, know, I think it covers quite a bit of it. One thing that I would add is um, we did a major study that Eric briefly mentioned about where we interviewed victim participants in four different countries in Africa about their sense around the International Criminal mm -hmm. Court and what their experience has been of that process. And this was at the height of the moment that you're describing when many African leaders, particularly those who'd been indicted or had warrants of arrest out, were claiming that this was a neo-colonialist enterprise. And as someone who was studying here in Berkeley at the time and um, on the faculty, I think it's an issue really worth interrogating about the reach of justice and the equity of justice. At the same time, we interviewed over 600 people and the majority of victims who were interviewed about their experience were very much, I remember there was one quote that jumped out at me where they said, our political leaders already have a thumb on the scale of justice what we need is the international community to come and put a thumb on the other side. And the idea was that they needed that weight to help give their impressions and their experiences and their voices the power that their leaders already had. Yeah. Um, and that's haunt, that's stuck with me ever since as one of the roles of the victim's court. Um, but I would agree with you that it's not perfect and it is something that is clearly, if it is going to be a global court. But it's not about the African state. It's right. this general terms. There is a problem. Mm. that the cooperation is not always perfect. Mm. But at the same time, we have cooperation provided by non-strict parties. So, including the United States. Including in the United aspects. States. Including the United States, obviously. I think we have enough time for maybe one, maybe two questions. Why don't we, oh, you know what? I haven't gotten anyone in that side yet. <laughs> so why don't we go over here and then we'll come up to the front. And if we have time, I will get you as well. Uh, hello, thank you so much for giving me a chance. Uh, I'm so happy and I really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm so happy and it's my honor to, for the first time, a person from Afghanistan uh, see in person with a president of IRCC court. Um, I'm so happy, uh, but I'm so sorry. I know my question is not involved in your topic for today, but um, I have, it is a little uh, personal, I want to know a little personal your view as a, a president that you are working for justice in all over the world. Um, you say that a judge cannot put pressure or cannot arrest a victim or cannot arrest the criminal people. Uh, I know this is the responsibility for the prosecutor. They have to make a claim and then present for the IRCC court because Afghanistan doesn't have very good prosecutor 
to follow their cases, and we are witnesses the violation of human rights, especially against women's rights, and also, on the other hand, it is uh, like an apartheid against women in Afghanistan, and it is increased day by day, and no one is care about this issue. Uh, I think everyone forgot Afghanistan and women of Afghanistan. What is your message mm -hmm. as a person that you are president of justice for Afghan women? We have to have patience more or we have to start or make a decision and how we can advocate for Afghan people the one day we can have uh, a case in IRCC court and we achieve our rights. Thank you so much. Thank you for this question, but you know, being a judge, I cannot discuss the details of the pending investigation, simply because it's what my independence required. As you know, it, the uh, investigation in Afghanistan was authorized by judges, and now is in the hand of the prosecutor. As long as the prosecutor will not present the requests or motions to the court, there is no judicial activity. But it is how the system works. But the, it is the pending situation. And therefore, I have not only, I can't, but I have also no idea what's going on. I don't know. Because it is the confidential um, things is the hand of the prosecutor, and we judges have to wait for the result. And to be true, I didn't say that we have no power to, to, to arrest someone. We have the power to arrest, but we have no power to enforce this decision. You know, there are two different things. We, we, we are decision makers, but we cannot enforce this decision because we have no their own enforcement mechanisms and forces. Thank you. I think we have time to get in this one last question very quickly. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm wondering, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think are the possibilities for and the obstacles to um, holding corporate actors accountable for mass atrocities at the ICC. Um, we know that um, the ICC does not have jurisdiction over corporations themselves because they're not natural persons, but what about the corporate directors that direct these crimes? Are you in a specific so situation? Or I, I think the question is something along the lines of, are you able to hold corporations to account, or at least the leaders of those corporations to account when they are complicit in atrocity? Yeah, when we are criminal court. It means that we are, we are dealing with the responsibility of natural individual persons. Of course, it, it could be the commanders, yeah? And we have the, even the special form of the criminality, which is common responsibility, which mm -hmm. is uh, specifically uh, um, uh, constructed for these uh, situations. But it does not mean that the, someone who is not the natural person could be accused and, uh, and uh, it could be accountable before the International Criminal Court. I don't know what is the question, but... but uh, Mostly if there's yeah. a, a way to hold companies accountable when the atrocities have been... Um, perpetrated through some kind of corporate action or the individuals at the heads of those companies. But be behind every action are individuals. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's always individuals who's responsible for any action. And we are interested only in responsibility of the person who is behind this action. Well, with that, I want to thank all of you for your questions. I'd like to thank President Hofmanski on behalf of Berkeley Law and the Human Rights Center.